Hello and welcome YouTube and Grim Dawn community. Today it's time for yet another Grim Dawn basic series. In this one we're gonna check out how to make your own build. This one we're gonna try to summarize some of my other episodes together, bring up all the information together in one piece and help you guys out with planning and making your own builds. So the most helpful tool for everything Grim Dawn related is GrimTools.com and if you don't know about this website yet or also don't know how to use it yet, I suggest you to check out my episode 5 Grim Tools. There I do explain everything in detail on how to use this website. Now the first and most important question when you're making a new build is which first mastery do I want to use, right? Everything in Grim Dawn is respectable except for mastery, so the mastery decisions have to be done a little bit more careful than other decisions. Now, the first thing that you have to know is like what is my main mastery supposed to be? What do I want to use as my main damage spell, right? Now there are several viable damage spells, like main damage spells in Grim Dawn. If you want to like know which one is a viable damage spell and which one is not a viable damage spell, I suggest you to check out my episode 2 where I talk about all the masteries and also like talk about some skills like main damage abilities of the masteries, supporting abilities, etc, etc. Right? And once you know what are like the main damage abilities in Grim Dawn for the mastery of your choosing, then you should also ask yourself, does my ability also like fall off later or not? Or is it like accessible early as well? Or do I have to like spend lots of points into it to get it first? Such as, for example, the AR from Arcanus, right? Or is it good early on but falls off? Such as Odextra's Flash Freeze or Blackwater Cocktail. Like these can be good end game, but they need certain supportive gear. Otherwise, they will just end up being supportive abilities later on. Or in the case of OFF, straight up useless. Or is the main ability of my choosing a ability that can be used from early game all the way to end game is like viable throughout all stages of the game, such as for example Soldier's Force Wave or Shaman's Primus Strike. Now these are just some examples and as I just said, I should have covered almost all of them in my episode 2, so if you're like unsure which kind of ability your ability of choosing is, is it a main damage ability, is it not a main damage ability, is it just a supportive ability, does it fall off, does it not fall off, etc. Then you should check out my episode 2 and your questions should hopefully be answered there. Now once you have decided on your main damage ability and also your mastery, the next question would be how do I level this up? How do I allocate my skill points with each level? How do I proceed here? If you want to have some in-depth answers for each single mastery, you can also check out my mastery leveling series. There I will cover most of the popular leveling specs for each build and also my favorite ways of leveling these masteries. It might be however that I did not cover your main ability or like your ability of choosing in those videos. So I'm gonna talk about some generic guidelines on how to allocate skills while leveling here in a bit. Then I'm gonna talk about which green monster frequency you can use while leveling and also for endgame that fit your build independently of using any legendary sets and also shortly talk about components. And after that I will also talk about devotions, what you have to consider when you're looking for your secondary mastery, and also you kind of have to know like what are the minimum requirements for a build to do endgame properly. To answer that question for you, I'm gonna show you some examples on my builds and also talk about some like generic values that you should try to reach. So let's talk about the skill allocation guidelines here. The general rule is that you should max out your main ability first and just one point your passives. And then once you have maxed out your main ability, you can start out also like putting more points or even maxing passives. And the passives that you should max out first should be the ones that give you either resistances, speed, damage, or resistance reduction. Depending on your mastery and your build, certain passives will be more useful earlier and some will be more useful later. Also know that all additive bonuses are usually more important early game than later, but also note that minus x percent resistance reduction is always additive as well and not multiplicative. But things like for example Heart of the Wild and Shaman which gives you like percent HP is gonna be multiplicative and thus pretty bad early and like way better later. Say for example as a necromancer you wanna level with Bone Harvest right? So you wanna like go for Bone Harvest ASAP. As long as a skill is like within the first 5 to 10 levels of a mastery it should be no problem to just like use own default attacks up to say level 4 or 5 until you get to your chosen skill. If however your chosen skill is like further down the line such as for example example AR and Arcanist, you should use like other ways of leveling until you have arrived at a certain level where this will be like a viable skill. As you can also see in my Heart to Level an Arcanist video where I use Trozen Sky Shard even if I want to use Eric's Aether Ray later on. So now once you have arrived at your chosen main damage ability, you want to kind of max this out ASAP, but also don't forget about defenses and also one point useful passives. And especially early on, defenses mean just putting more points into your mastery bar. Putting points into your master rebar will give you physique, cunning, and spirit, which you need to equip items. And also these attributes will give you offensive ability, defensive ability, energy regeneration, 
generation and HP. On top of that, mastery points give you flat energy and flat HP on top. The values here will be a little bit different for each mastery though. So in this case, for example, you would want to like put two to three points here per level. And also don't forget about some useful passives that you want to pick up along the line. So your next couple of levels would look something like this, right? You could, for example, put two points here, one point down the mastery bar until you have this maxed out. Or you could also put one point here, one point here and here. So you now you have like one point here into this useful passive, right? And you can like proceed to put two points here, one point here, two points here, two points here. Now you have already maxed out your main damage ability basically, and this is gonna carry you a long way. In the case of Bone Harvest, since this is basically a weapon damage based ability, you probably also want to use default attacks in between Bone Harvests for that. In the case of Necromancer in this very specific example, you could also reuse some like one point of Reaping Strike and Necrotic Edge, for example like this. Right? Now, you kind of want to also make your way towards Dread and Soul Harvest because these are connected to your main damage ability and they are pretty good in this case. You want to rush for these as well while also like putting some useful one-pointers, right? Push all the way here and like now put like two points here per each point and then move on to Soul Harvest. So now you basically have your main damage ability maxed and you have some like one pointers into your passives. You could also like put one point into Mark of Torment here actually instead of the point down here. And this would be a perfect example of like how to proceed with the general rule run. Now after you have maxed your main damage ability, you want to look out for supportive abilities. And also you want to max or like put more points into the passives that are actually useful for your build. Now useful passives are passives that give you either resistances, speed, damage bonuses or resistance reduction. In the case of Necromancer, he does not have any buffs that give you resistances, he has buffs that give you speed, in this case Harbinger of Souls, and it does have a passive that gives you resistance reduction, Spectral Wrath. Spectral Binding also gives you more health, Aether damage, flat Aether damage and defensive ability, so this is really really helpful later if you need more HP or, or A. And also it's always helpful if you're playing Aether, right? If you're playing Aether you should probably max this out very very soon, probably around now. And if you're not playing Aether you can like skip this until a little bit later. And if you're like playing Physical or Vitality for example you should max this out first before this. And you should also max this out before this if you're playing Aether actually. But you can like max out both at the same time kind of if you're playing Aether. So yeah the next couple of levels would look like this. You wanna like push here first. You want to get your Harbinger of Souls, that will be like the main uh, damage amplification for you, right? You get more attacks, even more casting speed, and so on. And then you also want to max out like Respectful Wrath for the resistance reduction. And then you want to look out for supportive abilities, such as for example El Omen, to like reduce enemy damage by 25%. Or you also want to check out your other one point this year so far, right? You have Necrotic Edge and Reaping Strike. And since these are damage oriented, you could also like put these to 9 points. You get them up to like 25% attack chance and this one also to 9 points or even 12 points for like another target maximum or also like just leave it at 7 points actually. Like the exact number of points that you want to put here into say a weapon pool skills or so some of these passive things or like active defensive abilities like just Mark of Torment for example also will like depend heavily on the skill that you're using. But like the general rule of thumb is as I said like you want to max out your main ability first while also pushing your mastery bar and also just like one point passes first and then later decide which passive do you want to put to a certain sweet spots such as these at 9, 7 or 9 or 12 or this one at 6 for example. And this will kind of come down to experience and also you reading these tooltips of these skills properly and figuring out which point actually give you like the most value. Right? You can see that like from 6 to 7 you get plus 1 target, you get some more weapon damage and also like 1% more chance to be used on this ability. You will also see that like up to 9 you will still get like more chance to be used on those and then after that you will not get any more chance for this to be used. But on 12 points you still get like plus one target. So by paying proper attention to the tooltips of the abilities, you can like figure out the sweet spots 7, 9 and 12 in this case. Let's take another quick example here of the typical prom strike shaman, right? So you want a one point passives, right? You want a one point passives, you want to max your main ability while also pushing the bar. Then you want to max torrent and proceed like this, right? You want to max the storm surge maybe as well points here. Also, you're probably like playing thunder strike, right? So you had like this active all the time already. And yeah, you continue on putting useful one pointers right when you go to them it's a pretty nice one pointer as well and then you can also like proceed all the way to storm colors pack right and again 
now you want put all the passives or like supportive skills such as this one as well and now you can hover over these passives right you can see this one gives you like life still actually plus one per point more last still if i put one more point here so this should be pretty good at two points right you can see that this one gives you like more damage the more you put here so you just probably want to max this next now you can see that this one gives you resistances and resistances are really really important early and later so yeah you want to max this out and like free up some like pierce and aether resistance on your character you can see this one kind of only gives you like percent hp and percentages are like good later but early game they're actually not that good like multiplicative percentages these are additive percentage resistances are always additive not multiplicative actually except for type c resistance reduction which has the wording x percent reduced targets resistances for example the debuff from hand of ultos which has 20 percent reduced targets and resistances this will be multiplicative and not additive resistance reduction but there is no such stat like x percent increased resistances right which would take like your total resistance and then multiply it with a certain factor that does not exist in the game this one is multiplicative that's why it's like better later and not that great early and you can see this one is flat lightning and flat hp so i mean okay let's like the next thing to max out right and now you want to get like resistance reduction supportive spell right like this for example and boom you're done right so just these two quick examples for like a general rule of thumb on like how to level your masteries next thing you want to like think about and also check out before you plan a build actually kinda is you want to see which green items like which monster and frequency are good for your build grim dawn has this awesome system of monster and frequency which means there are certain items that can be found from certain enemies only but on the other hand that also means that you will be able to target farm these and you will be getting one of these guaranteed as long as you just kill that one specific enemy over and over again until you get it right as of right now meaning patch 1.1.7.x Grimdawn has a total of 1620 monster and frequency with possibly more coming in future patches also note that mostly people talk about green monster and frequency there are also blue and purple monster and frequent. Not every monster and frequent is a green item, and also not every green item is a monster and frequent. And for some of these, it will be like a little bit harder. For some of these, it will be like really, really, really easy to get them actually. So like depending on the act these enemies spawn in, depending on the rarity of the mob, right, it's gonna be probably too hard for you now, but like doable later only. So those are, that are like, for example, marked as red here. Yeah, just forget about these. These are nemesis monsters or super bosses. So yeah, these are not gonna be available for you while leveling. And if it has like a purple boss here, then you kind of need to like check out where you find this guy. How strong he is and how late into the game you will meet him and uh, like the harder he is to kill the stronger he is the later you meet him into the game the more useless the item will be for you while leveling right so the easiest items to aim for would be like some that drop also from like yellow or orange mobs right and you can like perfectly plan around getting some of these like there will be like lots of enemies that drop these right so yeah, not this one these for example right so what you can do for example is you write the skill of your choice in here and then you will see which items support that skill for example for prime strike now lots of these blue and legendary items are gonna be random drop right if you check down here for example if it doesn't say dropped from this means that this is a random drop and thus you should not count on getting these right so let's just remove epics and legendaries here for now and now we're back to the green ones and the green ones are either faction items in this case which means that you can buy them from faction vendors or they are dropping from specific enemies right so you can just target from these from easy to fight enemies for example you could get a corvin storm helmet as early as level 20 dropping from these guys over in act 7 so if you have for example the forgotten guns expansion you should maybe like plan your leveling path around going into act 7 right after act 1 after killing warden Creek, right you should maybe like go into act 7 instead of continuing on into act 2 if you want to play like a melee promise strike character because then you would have a chance to get this weapon from all of these enemies and then because of that have a like way stronger item for your build way earlier into the game than if you chose the other level and route while like act two to four first right additionally to just searching for your skill over here you can also always click onto skill item modifiers item skill modifiers right and then choose your skill that you want to level with for example say canister bomb on the demolitionist and then the website will show you only items that give you a certain skill modifiers for your chosen skill and again you can see what is like the lowest level that you can get this at where they drop so by clicking on one of these enemies for example and then checking their spawn locations you can kind of 
of like see where you want to go to and together with the world map kind of plan your like individual leveling route you can also search for certain places over here like i don't know howling chasm right yeah just click on this and then you know where it is now let me also talk about components here real quickly if you want to check out more in-depth info about components in general i recommend you to check out my episode 7 where i talk about components here in this video i just want to quickly mention that you should always 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 use components on every single slot while leveling in the end game basically all the time as soon as you get components you should use them and you should always also try to prioritize components that give you resistances such as for example silk swatches on the shoulders and pants or anti venom solves on your belt which also gives you armor and like bad armor is global armor right you can see that's carried it, for example like level 64 is in like an elite has like all of its resistances maxed out except for the sun rest but i mean that's not a that much resistance right components play a vital role to like maxing all these resistances during leveling and also in the end game i also just want to shortly mention that there are basically four tiers of components there are farmable components that drop from either some specific trash mobs or some bosses as well like for example carry and shattered soul right the second tier of components will be components that can be crafted from the blacksmith as a baseline craft this means that once you have rescued the blacksmith you can just talk to him and you can craft these type of components you don't need to find any blueprints for these you can just go to the blacksmith and craft them there as long as you have the needed materials obviously and the next tier of components would be those that require you to get a faction blueprint first for these for example the aether soul right this one is available at the devil's crossing faction vendor after reaching respected status so whenever you have reached a new status for these factions you should always check out their quartermasters or like faction vendors as i used to call them and buy all the new recipes that you can buy there so that you can craft new components for example and the fourth and final tier are components that have blueprints that you need to find first and these blueprints are usually random drops so you have to like farm for these basically there are some vendors such as for example the vinyl ton and the ancient grove that can also sell you some additional blueprints just make sure to like check out all kinds of vendors when you like venture through karen right in the dungeons faction vendors and so on and like buy all the blueprints because they also have blueprints for components which are really good actually so after you have done all of that, right, after you have decided on your first mastery, after you have decided on your damage ability, after you have decided on the monster and frequency that you want to aim for while leveling, after you kind of have a decent idea on like how to level and allocate your skill points within those mastery, now it's the time to think about devotions and also secondary classes. I'm not saying you shouldn't use devotions until this point, you should definitely use devotion points once you get them. Use them ASAP, they're really easy to respect. Also don't forget you have a search bar at the bottom right where you can always search for whatever you want to look for and in the game the search bar will be in the middle at the top now for devotions you have certain rules as well number one is you absolutely need to get the resistance reduction devotion for your damage type the solar is which fire at which fire here at proc has minus 23 percent fire rr and 35 percent chaos rr this is a mandatory devotion for every fire and chaos build if you were playing i don't know like a promise strength build then arcane bomb would be the mandatory rr devotion for you because of the minus the 5% lighting resistance reduction. Number two would be to get a X reduced resistance reduction devotion, which I usually refer to as flat resistance reduction, or some other people refer to as type A resistance reduction, I believe, unless that is already covered by your masteries. Note that this resistance reduction type does not stack with other sources of the same type, so you only need to get one of those, and the highest will only apply. So try to get only one, and try to get a pretty decent value. So anything above 20 is usually already pretty good. Then you should also try to get some sustain or tankness via devotions for example for weapon damage based characters you want to get the ghoul for other characters you want to get either bat or giant or phoenix or turtle or dryad or even tree of life and also don't forget about the crab and chariot also for some meta builds you can also use guardian's gaze due to the lifesteal on this one note that additionally every single devotion that has percent weapon damage can also life leech off your global lifesteal percent over here on the second page of your character so you want to get some kind of combination of those mentioned devotions unless you got like huge amounts of love from your monsteries but that has to be like really a lot a lot and even then you probably want to like get at least one sustained devotion on top of that and then after you have taken your minus x percent resistance reduction devotion and as well as maybe like one or two sustained devotions you want to check out your tier 3 devotions so that you know what you want to aim for and as you should know from my other videos devotions can basically be separated into three tiers right these tier 3 devotions are located in the outer ring of this devotion map they don't give you any affinity completion bonus and they usually have a combined affinity requirement value of something between 20 and 30. You should usually try to plan your build around having one, two, three tier three devotions in the end. 
Then you have tier 1 devotions, which only require one affinity that you can get from the crossroad. And they also give you lots of affinity, like something between 3 and 6 points usually. Then you have tier 2 devotions, which require usually around maybe like 10 affinity total. And give you a completion bonus of something between 2 up to like 5 to 6 affinity. Early into the game though, you probably want to use a tier 1 devotion that has an active damage ability to help you out with your damage. Also more often than not I choose to just use bat early game on most of my characters actually. This one is really nice if you're playing pierce or vitality obviously but it's also useful for castles that don't really have other means of sustain. Also twin fangs can be really good later on a caster if you convert the pierce or vitality towards the damage type that you're actually dealing. If you don't really need the sustain early on you can for example go for a tier 1 devotion which has the corresponding damage type that your character also wants to deal, such as for example Tsunami for Cold and Lightning, Aether Fire for Fire and Aether, Flame Torrent for Fire or Chaos, Falcon Swoop for Bleed and Physical, and Bull Rush for Internal Trauma and Physical. Also you have Scorpion Sting for Poison and Acid, and Guardian's Gains for Acid and Chaos. If you're using a shield then Targus Hammer might be pretty good for you, and if you're playing a Pierce or Physical build, Assassin's Spark early is also really good already. Good defensive devotions to also get early on are Turtle Shell and Good if you are weapon damage based and you want the lifesteal and additional circuit breaker ASAP, you should probably even like aim for ghoul first. Also if you're playing pets, you basically just want to get shepherd's call. Now there are some additional ways to do this and if you for example are using a two-hander with promise strike and you don't really need the damage that early on because your main ability is like lots of damage anyway and there are some like good tier 1 devotions that you also can use that don't have a active skill such as for example eel or sailor's guide. These are really good and they also help you with early game leveling because of their really good movement speed 6% of eel and 8% of sailor's guide and in the case of a two-hander and you want to rush the kraken you just need to like get the spider and the eel right or candle and eel if you want to get there even faster and then you're done and can get the crack. So in some specific cases I would say it is better to skip these tier 1 devotions with an active in order to get to a tier 2 devotion a little bit faster. But generally I would say that for leveling it is usually better to have one of these tier 1 devotions for extra damage. Unless you really really know which secondary class you want to play, I would always wait a bit with your secondary class because again, masteries are the only thing in the game that are locked, everything else is respectable. So it's totally fine to wait until say around level 40 to 50 with your second mastery choice. And you should take your time with this and like ask yourself what do I need to like complement my build, what do I need to like amplify my damage, what do I need to make myself tankier, etc etc. Right? Say if you are still a fire strike demolitionist, right, then you would have for example the choices of choosing a secondary master that also has a resistance reduction for your damage type such as Aura of Sanger on Inquisitor or Vulnerability on an Occultist or Celestial Presence on an Oathkeeper. Also you might want to look out for like style or weapon specific buffs such as ranged expertise for ranged weapons, brute force for two handers and also if you're playing a default attack replacer build you want to also look out for weapon pool skills such as bursting round, shing rounds, Storm Spread, Feral Hunger, or Corwin's Advantage, Zolhan's Technique, or Smite for example. Also don't forget that Inquisitor's ranged expertise allows you to dual wield ranged weapons, and Nightblade's dual blades allows you to dual wield many weapons. You also might want to keep out an eye for abilities that help you fix your resistances, such as Steel Resolve in Inquisitor, or Oak Skin in Shaman, or Decorated Soldier and Scars of Battle, or Aspect of the Guardian. Also other good ways of mitigating damage are for example flat damage absorption, such as the flat damage absorption in Ascension or in the Inquisitor's Seal or in Blast Shield. Other layers of defense include percent absorption such as Maven's Fear of Protection or Possession and then also enemy damage reduction such as for example the reduced target's damage. Note that this type of debuff does not stack with itself so you cannot for example use Ill Omen and stack that with DK. Warcry is another example of that and also Nullification which only works against elemental damage though. And last but not least you might wanna check out for panic buttons and circuit breakers such as Mirror of Erectus in Arcanus Tree, the Blast Shield circuit breaker and Demolitionist, or the Man Here's Will circuit breaker for soldiers that have two-handed melee weapons or shields, or also the Resilient circuit breaker and Oathkeeper. When it comes to endgame level 100 plus for like main campaign you should like aim for 2.6k OA and DA and then for like other non main storyline content you should aim for 2.8k OA and DA as a minimum. You can for example see that this character has 3k this is pretty good uh, if you have a little bit less that's also fine and then you also want to usually try to get like around 2k armor or more if you have terrible armor like this character though 
there are other ways of like mitigating that damage, such as for example via physical resistance. Physical resistance can help you additionally to armor mitigate physical damage and it's really really good especially for low armor characters. Also don't forget about CC resistances guys, don't have 0% here like I have. And also try to have stun resistance at something at least above 55%. This guy is kind of a bad example when it comes to CC resistance sounds because this guy can get away with way lower values than usual because he can still love it a lot whenever you are stunned or petrified etc. So let's pull up another example here. Yeah so I would generally say that anything above 60% stun is pretty good. This stuff can also be higher than 29% but it's kind of hard to get these higher and slow rest should ideally also be really good but yeah anything that's like 50% or higher here is already kind of good I would say it's kind of hard to get it on any character and those resistance times are not as important as the normal damage resistance cells such as cold, fire, lightning, acid, pierce, chaos, aether, vitality and bleed. Now in Grim Dawn, especially once you enter elite, resistances are not optional they are totally mandatory to max out to 80%. 80% is like the default maximum. You can increase that with items that give you, for example, plus maximum all rats. There are some items, there are some devotions that do this. But yeah, normally you're totally fine having these just 80%. And for the very, very end game, I would suggest you to try to overcap these as well, though. So usually you want to have around like 35% overcap. There are some damage types where you want even more. There are some where you can get away with a little bit less. I would say that, for example, for Pierce and Bleed, you can get away with a little bit less than that. But for example, for Elemental, you kind of want more than that. There are some enemies that just like cut your resistances into half. So you're only safe against those like type of resistance reduction when you actually have like for example fire overcap by 80% but I mean those are some special enemies and as a like a general rule of thumb I suggest you to like just max out your resistances first to 80% while leveling you don't really like have to care too much about overcapping that is something for endgame only while leveling try to max your resistances to 80% though try to have at least at least at the very least 100 HP per level and for hardcore I would suggest something like 150 HP per level rather and ideally even more effective HP due to like absorption skills or damage reduction debuffs on enemies and then for the end game you also want to like overcap resistances by like 35 percent or even more now when it comes to weapon damage numbers and attack speed numbers i mean if you're playing an attack speed character right you want to have attack speed at 200 percent ideally at least with procs and usually weapon damage numbers between say i don't know 20k to 40k can be viable depending on like which default attack replacer you are using depending on the damage type depending on your weapon pool skills etc there are lots of like things that will give you like additional damage damage here towards this weapon damage but when it comes to like grim tools numbers usually something between 20k and 40k is good but i mean this is only important for builds that are heavily built around weapon damage obviously that attack speed number is going to be a little bit harder to reach when you're playing with a two-hander because usually two-handers just have like a little bit less attack speed and you might want to try to make up for that with like a little bit higher weapon damage and I mean, if you're playing a casting speed character, such as for example Aether Ray, then you want to have your casting speed max to 200%. And if you're playing a cooldown reduction based caster, then obviously cooldown reduction is going to be very important. And anything above like 30% is, I believe, already pretty good. And you can get even higher numbers here, I guess, if you have like certain items or procs and combinations, etc. Also note that time dilation is a tier 3 devotion that does reduce your cooldowns by 6 seconds, which can also be really, really nice for all kinds of cooldown reduction based casters to reset both your offensive as well as your defensive abilities. Then you also want to check out your damage percent modifiers, right? For example, usually for endgame I try to get at least 2k percent bonus damage, right? For example, this Chaos build has 2.4k, this Aether build has also 2450 and this Lightning Druid has close to 2.2k. Also, if you are playing a damage over time build, try to get some decent duration modifiers on top. This will, like, make reapplying your dots way, way easier because, like, the dots are gonna last longer. When it comes to retaliation percent modifiers, I mean, anything, like, above 1.2 or 1.2, 1.3k can already be good enough. This character is kind of on the low side, I would rather say. Like 1.5, 1.6k with procs is kind of low. You can get like easily 2k here as well if you're trying hard enough. And also here you can see a example page for my fire skeleton cabalance. Here you can see the damage resistance numbers on that guy. Note that auras and buffs such as Blood of Dreek or like the aura from the Raven, Storm Spirit, does not apply here in Grim Tools, so it will not show you the additional 
uh, resistances from those buffs. But usually I think something around 1k or even more damage is pretty good. 873 is kind of on the low side here. This only summarizes plus all damage to pets, but I think it doesn't take into account damage specific modifiers such as like fire damage bonuses for example. Like these would have to be like added together manually and then like added on top of those, right? I honestly don't know why there isn't like a proper damage spreadsheet for pets as well. They could have just made it the same way as like the normal spreadsheet, right, for normal pet, like for normal magical and physical damage. But yeah, it doesn't exist and uh, for pets you kind of always have to like try to have a feeling for like how much damage you actually deal or don't deal. Right? At least that is my experience. I'm not a pet expert so I might be wrong about some stuff here. Alright, that's gonna wrap it up for this video. Thank you so so much everybody for watching, I hope this video was very useful for you as well, and I hope that you're gonna be able to make some new awesome builds with these guidelines. Feel free to post any builds that you've come up with down below, and I'll be happy to check them out. I also want to thank all of my Patreon supporters, as well as my Twitch subscribers here. Thank you so much everybody, without you guys I wouldn't be able to do this stuff. And also I hope to see you around in one of my next videos, maybe the next PvP tournament even, or one of my streams. Take care and see you around!